Welcome to the Stanford Radiology YouTube channel. Welcome back to our dental panorex series. This video is part two, where we cover all the different pathologies that the panorex can show us. If you haven't seen our first video on the indications and normal anatomy of the panorex, then click the link below. This part two video is by no means a comprehensive overview of all the different pathologies, but hopefully it gets you thinking for how the panorex can bite you. Our first category is teeth, and in our first case, which tooth is affected and what specific parts of that tooth are pathologic? Feel free to pause the screen if you need more time. If we do our tooth search pattern, we notice that the maxillary row of teeth look okay, but the left second mandibular molar looks different than the rest. More specifically, there's lucency involving the enamel and dentin with extension to the pulp chamber. This is an example of really bad dental caries. Not surprisingly, the patient was in a lot of pain. As a refresher, the pulp chamber carries the neurovascular bundle of the tooth. When there's infection, the pressure within the pulp chamber increases, causing significant pain. For our second case, again identify which tooth is affected and which specific parts of that tooth are pathologic. Like the last case, the maxillary dental row demonstrates no acute abnormality, but one of the mandibular teeth does. Zooming in, we see that a paraapical lucency surrounds the left first mandibular molar, the lamina dura and alveolar bones are lost, and these findings overall represent a paraapical abscess. Again, here's a diagram of what a normal periapical region should look like. Let's move on to trauma. Our next category. In case three, is there a bone fractured? And if so, which bone is fractured? Here, the teeth are normal. Remember to look at all the anatomic landmarks of the mandible that we learned before. Looking at the bones, don't be fooled by this midline extending from the bottom to the top of the image. This is just midline artifact from the chin rest that we discussed in part one. Also, don't be fooled by these. These symmetric lucencies are the superimposed airway. Instead, a fracture would be more linear and crisp looking. On closer examination, we find an oblique linear lucency through the left mandibular ramus. A follow-up CT confirms our initial suspicions. Note that the left TMJ is located, which is a pertinent negative. Here's our next case. Case four, is there a fracture? And if so, which bone is fractured? We see extensive dental hardware over both the maxillary and mandibular teeth, and also this unclear radiopaque structure overlying the right maxillary sinus. When looking at the bones, we see an asymmetric right zygomatic arch relative to the left. The left side is what an arch should look like, but instead, the right side was fractured. Our next category is sinuses. In case five, we have an individual presenting with forehead pain. Describe the abnormality. This panorex shows poor dentition with multiple dental caries and periapical lucencies. Since we're in the sinuses section though, note that there is asymmetric opacification of the left maxillary sinus relative to the right. This patient's forehead symptoms were likely due to referred pain from this region. Follow-up CT confirms our findings. This is a more subtle case of maxillary sinusitis on the left. And here is a more severe case on the right. Note how the right maxillary sinus is totally opacified on the CT. We're still in the sinuses section. In case six, we have someone presenting with cheekbone pain. Describe the abnormality. What sticks out here is that the bilateral third maxillary molars are way more superiorly located than the usual and compared to the adjacent teeth. Remember from our first video that the maxillary sinus floor runs below the hard palate on the panoramic projection. The maxillary molar roots can easily protrude into the maxillary sinus and cause odontogenic sinusitis. The yellow lines demarcate the lucent airspace between the roof of the tongue and the hard palate. Subsequent CT showed protrusion of the maxillary molar into the sinus floor, which the panorex nicely showed us already. See how useful the panorex is? 
All right, we're in our second to last category, neoplasms, which is full of varying pathologies. For case seven, describe the lesion. In the left mandibular body, there is a multicystic lesion in the region of the left mandibular molars with involvement of some of their roots. The lesion also appears to involve the inferior alveolar canal, where the same named nerve runs through. Additional CT features show this expansile lesion with cortical thinning. The classic descriptor is a soap bubble or honeycomb appearance, depending on the size of the internal cysts. This lesion turned out to be an ameloblastoma. As a brief overview, this neoplasm is benign but locally aggressive and of odontogenic origin. It commonly affects individuals between the third to fifth decade and presents with a slow growing swelling with or without pain or paresthesias. Patients typically report progressive tooth loosening, poor denture fit, or a change in dental occlusion. On imaging, we see that soap bubble appearance that we saw earlier, and the lesion usually arises from a tooth-bearing area, such as the mandibular or maxillary alveolus. The differential is wide, and the lesion is typically resected with post-operative imaging showed here. We're still in the neoplasms category. For case eight, describe this lesion. Without clinical history, it may be easy to dismiss the right mandibular area as simply missing teeth. But note how the mandibular body shows irregular superior margins, and there is suggestion of a lesion involving the mandibular ramus, angle, and body. CT shows how aggressive this lesion is. It's totally destroying the bone and invading into the soft tissues. This was actually a primary squamous cell cancer of the retromolar region that secondarily expanded to the bone. Here is another more severe case on Panorex with corresponding MR. And here is another. Since the alveolar nerve is damaged, the patient will typically have sensory loss in this region. Case 9. Describe the lesion. In the region of the right maxillary sinus and alveolar ridge, there is asymmetric opacification. This very well could be sinusitis like we saw earlier, but note how there is involvement of the molar root, suggesting something more sinister. CT showed this heterogeneous lesion with bony erosion and internal osseous matrix. MR highlighted the contrast-enhancing nature of this neoplasm, which was found to be an osteosarcoma. An osteosarcoma is a malignant bone tumor of mesenchymal origin. Approximately 10% of them involve the craniofacial region, and of those, half of them occur in the jaw, with the mandible more common than the maxilla. It has associations with radiotherapy from treating other prior cancers, and also secondary transformation from Paget's or fibrous dysplasia. Compared to its long bone counterparts, osteosarcoma in the jaw region typically occurs about 10 to 20 years later in the third to fourth decades. Symptoms include bony hard swelling with facial asymmetry, loose teeth, and a non-healing tooth abscess. The imaging features are similar to osteosarcoma in the long bones, and the differential involves a wide variety of other malignancies seen here. Benign things in the differential include osteomas and fibrous dysplasia. All right, we're nearing the end. Only a few more. Case 10. Describe this lesion. In this case, most of the teeth have erupted, except there's this right second mandibular molar, which isn't symmetric with the contralateral side. Zooming in, there's also this other calcific density with a thin, loosened rim along the margin of this uninterrupted tooth, and possibly interfering from its eruption. This lesion is characteristic of an odontoma. This neoplasm is a mixture of enamel, dentin, cementum, and pulp tissue, all the different elements of a tooth. There are two varieties. The compound odontoma refers to multiple small tooth-like structures surrounded by a radiolucent rim. The complex form is also surrounded by a radiolucent rim, but the center is a mineralized mass composed of primarily enamel and dentin. These lesions are often asymptomatic and usually found when investigative radiography is done because a tooth has failed to erupt. Odontomas are more commonly found in the second decade of life, 
and they're more common in the maxilla than the mandible. Differential includes supernumerary teeth, osteomas, and ameloblastic fibroodontomas. Second to last case. Describe this lesion. In the right mandibular ramus, angle, and body, there is patchy sclerotic area compared to the left. This very well could be a neoplasm, as seen earlier, but notice how I subtly changed this category to miscellaneous from neoplasm. This patient actually had bisphosphonate-induced osteonecrosis. The CT further highlights the mixed lytic sclerotic appearance with cortical destruction characteristic for osteonecrosis. Medication-related osteonecrosis of the jaw needs specific criteria. First, there needs to be a history of an anti-resorptive or anti-angiogenic medication, which has associations with this entity. Bisphosphonate use is the most common one. Next, there needs to be exposed, non-healed bone for more than eight weeks. And third, there should be no prior craniofacial radiation, which can mimic this entity. It is important to keep this diagnosis in the differential for patients with a history of cancer that have been previously treated with bisphosphonates. The presence of a pathologic fracture needs to be identified, and the differential includes infection with osteomyelitis, metastases, or osteoradionecrosis. Here's another example of this entity. Note how the entire mandible is sclerotic, and there's a clear pathologic fracture in the panorex as well as the CT. All right, here's our final case. Describe the right and left temporal mandibular joints. The TMJ consists of the mandibular condyle with the glenoid fossa of the temporal bone. Note that on the right, the joint space is narrowed relative to the left. As a refresher, this is what a normal TMJ should look like. Note how the joint space on both sides are not narrowed, and there's no abnormal sclerosis of the mandibular condyles or glenoid fossa. Going back to the original case, here is the follow-up TMJ MR. Going over the details of this particular protocol are out of the scope of this video, but briefly, note how the morphology of the condyle is diamond-shaped, suggesting osteophytic degenerative changes. As a comparison, here is the contralateral side. See how it is nice, rounded, and smooth, at least compared to the abnormal side? That's how it should look like. All right, well that wraps it up. This video is by no means comprehensive, but hopefully it got you thinking of how the Panorex can bite you. See you next time. Stay tuned for more Stanford radiology videos.